Uh, first thing first, Thomas, how are you these days? It's good, actually, yeah. Um, spring is coming. It looks like the virus is slowly going away. People are getting vaccinated. Uh, we have a new record coming out. So, yeah, <laughs> things are looking up a little bit. Oh, that's good to see. Hard, hard times, yeah. Yeah, that's very good to hear. So before we jump into the new record, I'd like to go back to the beginning a little bit. Now, when you started as a band there were four albums that came out in four years uh, kind of every year a new album um how do you look back at this very productive period for the band creatively well i guess you gotta take it into perspective that we were super young that we started like when we were hang on let me count back it was like 17 18 right you have a lot of more energy and also you don't uh, reflect as much you just write the songs and record them you know uh, for, that's good and bad i guess that youthful kind of pretentiousness you know right um and also we didn't tour much in those days you know there were more like local shows small small european tours whereas now uh, since the re reunion we toured a lot more and also maybe reflect a little bit more on the writing process. Right. So with that in mind, then, what do you, I, I don't know if you ever listened to those old songs or put on those records, but, but when you think back of those songs, what do you hear in a way now that you have uh, become a more reflective person? Well, I, I, I admire the youthful uh, arrogance almost mm -hmm. of it, you know? Um, it was a band of five really young people who in one way wanted to be like the King Crimson of death metal, you know? And right. uh, <laughs> but we didn't really think about that we barely had learned to play guitar. That didn't <laughs> matter to us. We thought we could do it anyway. And I liked that in a way. I would probably like those albums a lot um, if they were made by someone else. <laughs> but if you look back and listen to them, it's kind of like hard not to see what I have, would have done differently with the songs, specifically in the arrangement department. It's like a little bit too many riffs sometimes, maybe. But that also comes from that youthful kind of uh, ambition and pretentiousness, I guess. And then, but with that in mind, I mean, uh, Slaughter of the Soul, it was a, an important album of the, of the time. A lot of people listened to it. A lot of people found something in it and, and it started to lead its own life. So... Um, yeah, how do you see the, especially because the band broke up quickly after, and but but the kind of the band still lived on in the people's minds. What did that tell you about the music that you were making at that time? Um, yeah, it was it was a bit hard to. This is almost like before internet times a little <laughs> Fair bit. Enough, so yes. It was hard to really get a grasp on like the idea that a lot of people were listening to it and influenced by it, and you know like. Uh, statements from record labels were also not coming in as they should probably so we didn't know how much it was selling or anything mm. but um when we started seeing it, it it was flattering of course um a lot of people might think it might include some bitterness because we couldn't harvest from it but that was never really the point we were busy doing our other new bands and projects at the time we've always been looking forward not back so much and i guess that comes if you listen to the, all the records we've done it kind of makes sense because we never really look back that much. Mm. Well, let's start looking forward then. And uh, you have a new record out, The Nightmare of Being, or uh, coming out, The Nightmare of Being. When did you start to discover Thomas Vigotti's work? Well, <clears throat> uh, the starting point for that was actually uh, the first album with uh, my other band, The Lurking Fear. Mm. We, were, uh, we kind of dove really deep into the horror uh, genre of literature, revisiting Lovecraft a lot. And also then kind of, I was curious what was out there in modern, more modern uh, writers and stumbled, stumbled upon Ligotti, who has written a lot of good horror novels and short stories. Uh, but then Martin from the band uh, pointed me to this other book that he had written, like a non-fiction book, a more essay, about mm. uh, pessimist philosophy. Uh, and it just drew me in. Um, and a lot of the stuff I felt connected. I mean, mm. 
you know, I, I'm never going to be convinced of, of one philosophy or whatever, but some parts really like, oh yeah, this is interesting. This actually might be cool to try to see the world in this way. And also what grasped me was kind of was perfect for a death metal concept, you know? <laughs> right. And because it's philosophical, it's it's part of kind of, like you said, you, you have your own opinions about the world and, and, and kind of how things work. So getting delving into all that literature and then kind of that way of thinking uh, did that affect you in any way yeah i guess some parts of it has actually um but I, i've touched upon those ideas before but not in through that perspective but i like the the one idea about like because we're of course all, our knowledge of our mortality and all that and like the search for all the answers and the pessimist philosophy basically says like there are no answers and you know yeah you're going to die nothing's going to happen afterwards and just you know whatever darkness and but to protect ourselves from that thought we have built all these defense mechanisms of course like religion and all the different political isms and whatnot and the idea that one of the some of the writers touched upon was like to just uh, being aware of the defense mechanisms. You don't have to like really take all of the blinders away, but just to be aware of them could make you live your life a little bit more fully and appreciative of, of what you actually have instead of you know looking for what you don't have. Right. And that kind of like struck with me a little bit as, a, as almost like a positive message, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I've, I've always found and Now I can't remember if this was from uh... True Detective. I don't know if you know the show, but that was uh, yeah, True yeah, Detective, yeah. the nihilistic uh, perspective yeah. uh, by by Rusty. And I, I think they talked about the, that there is a very thin line between uh, pessimism and realism in a way. Yeah. Uh, so how do you feel about that? I, I've always found that interesting, that thought. No, of course. I mean, pessimism, um, some of the key uh, philosophers probably have an even bleaker outlook, of course. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. Um, but I mean, there's still a connection there. I like the idea that there's no disappointed pessimists. You know, I like I like I like that phrase a lot. You know, and, um, <laughs> I think that like I have that line in one of the choruses of the songs, like "Pessimism is the last refuge of hope." Mm, right. Um, yes. And I guess I, 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 even in the all the darkness of the record, it's a dark and layered, full uh, album. But even within it, it still has that little desperate kind of hope that at the gates always had ever ever always present you know mm. well, well this is maybe this is a silly question but why is having that, that uh, little sense of hope so important uh, especially for for the type of music that you make i think within like the little um how can you say the border between hope and despair you have the those feelings of melancholy and desperation and those are two emotions that we have always kind of embraced musically with with the band. So it fits our concept really well, you know, to to have that little little tense little bit of hope in it. Because otherwise, there's no dynamic. If everything is just dark, mm -hmm. then you don't feel that desperation or like the urge or you know to to live life full or whatever. So without that hope, there could not be the desperation, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> Right, and you mentioned that this, uh, this is uh, at least partly based in the, in the music and uh, the sonic landscape of the band. So, and I, I would say since 2014, but especially with this new record now, you've expanded that sound again. Um, so what was the approach? Was it completely open, like a, like a blank slate and, and you could do anything uh, or try anything you wanted? Yeah, I, I guess what I have always made us tick is to be creative and explore and be a, you know, have an eclectic mindset, mm -hmm. but within the boundaries of what At The Gates, the At The Gates sound, sound is. And I think that is the challenge that pushes us forward. It could be very easy for us to do an over the top experimental progressive record mm -hmm. that we could do that like in a blink, mm -hmm. but to do it and make it still sound like At The Gates, that's the hard part. And, I think that's what also drives us. You know? Right. Well, with that in mind, then, what was this process like? Because do you start then by experimentation and then kind of uh, 
try to fit that within uh, your identity or does it happen the other way around? Uh, how do you no, kind of I, I think we, we basically sit down and, and talk about what kind of emotions a certain like a, a project should uh, cater to. Mm. Uh, and then we're talking more like which kind of harmonies and stuff like that. And then the actual songwriting with the more like the, how can you say it, arrangements and uh, different uh, instrumentation. That's like the, the, the sparkle on top of it. And then we see, does it fit or not on, on top of that? But the main core will always be the emotional aspect and then the songwriting and then more like the how we orchestrate it, mm. the more adventurous parts, so to say. Yeah, and, and within this process, and I suppose for all of the songwriters you do, uh, what is your how the uh, what is your relation with uh, Jonas? Because he does a lot of the arrangements, and you do the lyrics, and and they have to uh, that they don't have to, but they can feed off each other. So, yeah. so what is no, the... there's, there's a constant discussion all the time, and I mean I I have told him on a number of occasions that no, this doesn't fit. It's, it's, it has a different emotion. This part of the song. I mean, you, you know, because a song is constructed with a lot of different parts. But if, for example, like the riff that plays under the soul of the song has some notes that, like, emotionally doesn't connect with the lyrics, then I tell him. And I mean, it's it's very easy to work with Jonas because he's very um, he has no real ego about it. He's more focused on the end product, and he trusts me with my judgment. So we basically arrange everything together. I mean, some of the songs have come almost straight from his first ver version, and I've only touched a little bit. But some of them are really collabs where he has just started with one or two parts, and I kind of, it could go here in this direction. And then you right. write something like according to my <laughs> suggestions, so to say. But does it happen the other way around then that you that you will hear a certain riff or a certain sound or an opening and, and that will influence lyrics for you? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, it has happened before. Uh, one example is the, the Night Eternal from At War With Reality. Because it was a very desperate song and then but the end part is very like almost like triumph triumphant. A uh, thing we never really did before, and all of a sudden it's like it really fits really well. But then the lyrics had to go in another direction at the end there, and I was like, "Could this still work within the concept?" And we talked about it, and yeah, mm. it worked out, and it became something it wasn't from the start. So yeah, it definitely influence each other. Yeah, right. And in terms of the the themes uh, that we discussed earlier, uh, is that a conversation you have with the band as well? Do you go to, to guys and say, hey, this is what I'm reading now. This is what I'm into. Uh, how do you feel about it? Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's always a, a discussion about everything. And even if me and Jonas are the main songwriters, everybody mm -hmm. are like involved and kind of knows in which direction we're pushing it and come with, come with uh, small suggestions here and there. Um, and I always try to tie it in, especially with Jonas, because he has to write music to it, mm -hmm. but also with Martin uh, Larson, the guitar player, because he reads even more than I do. So it's, okay. he knows a lot, he knows more about some of these issues that, that I've written about than, than I do. Uh, so I always kind of take it with him as well, like a filter a little bit. Right. Well, very quickly in between, and do you have uh, maybe one or two recommendations of books within that sphere? Because I, I believe that the book by, um, no, I forgot his name, Ligotti kind of uh, uh, had references to a lot of uh, literature, yeah. uh, works of literature. So Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of them. Uh, basically anything uh, by Kioran, I would say, uh, the Romanian writer, uh, I could say that probably has a lot, but I mean, of course he had a lot of different stuff, but it, I could say that he has been really influential as well. Um, Becker, uh, what's that called? That's called Denial of Death. I think I'm actually having to look through a little list here that I have of the books I ordered. <laughs> is that okay? Uh, no, that is perfect. Because uh, I have the receipt, <laughs> the receipts. That's how I work. Uh, but Kioran and Becker definitely Schopenhauer of mm. course um, but then it's also like the more uh, like uh, 
normal literature, so to say, novels, like Bruno Schulz, uh, Kartarescu from Romania as well. It's a lot of stuff that actually is not uh, non-fiction, but it's influenced by pessimism. Right. Well, so well, yeah, and I don't know. I don't really hear them, but I mean, and I don't really fear uh, find the thing, but. I think we still I mean, touched you, upon a few. Yeah, there. you gave a, a good couple of names, so, so so we can Google. So that, that'll be fine. But well, one thing, because you say that it kind of ties in with with a more no, a normal literature as well. What one thing, uh, as I was listening to the album, and obviously I can't hear every word, but kind of getting the overall concept. Uh, one thing it reminded me of was *Crime and Prejud Prejudice* by um, Dostoevsky, because it deals with that conscience and that that eternal torture in your mind, in a way. Well, uh, crime, crime and punishment. Uh, crime or, and punishment, yeah. yeah. Yeah, No, 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 yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the thing when you start working on a project like this, and you, but you still read normal novels on the side, so to say, you're always going to find stuff within it that connects, you know, because you subconsciously probably choose mm. books that are connecting in, in some way, you know? Right. Um, and uh, a lot of them, I, I was halfway through uh, Gravity's Rainbow with Thomas Pynchon at one point when I started this, and there's a lot of pessimism going on there. It was a nihilism and Kartarescu as well. Uh, and even like the the South Americans, I went back to Borges a little bit okay. and it's the same thing there. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff that goes together. <laughs> And at the same time, it's kind of it's a similar question as I asked earlier because you, uh, I asked how it affected you. But is is it also um, can it also be like a rabbit hole you, you you kind of fall into a little bit with with those things? Yeah, de definitely, definitely. I mean, it's um, you have to uh, how can you say it? Take time off. <laughs> Sometimes you have to have like uh, something. A, a normal EC read page turner on the side sometimes. And also maybe when you're in this kind of process, don't listen to anything that is similar to what you're doing. Mm. Uh, so basically, I mean, on the side, I was reading some science fiction and listening to jazz on the side <laughs> with, with this record, just to not like in, let it interfere and also have another escape. Mm. Because the main escape was writing the record, but that became such a big project, project, you know? Right. Well, the, the reason I ask is because I, 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 when I Googled uh, Lugati, I, I came across a quote by him where he kind of stressed the importance of, of having a sense of humor as well. So the, the, even yeah. though kind of, if, even if that is your perspective that the world around you is dying and it all, all is meaningless, you can have a sense of humor about it in a way. Yeah, definitely. And I think uh, a lot of these guys have. And uh, Lugati writes very how can you say it's not scientifically but also a little bit funny sometimes mm -hmm. to you know to drag you in a little bit so yeah it's it, i mean the pessimist doesn't have to be a, a boring uh <laughs> gloomy person it can just be a person who has a little bit different outlook on the main themes of life but still tries to like live your life as good as possible you know right well now that we're we are in a i mean a lot of people i would say are, are somewhat more pessimistic these days than they have been in previous years just because of what the world is going through at the moment um, yeah. how have you handled that that a certain aspect of what you do of your craft is now gone in playing live or what has been well I, I guess for us it was um again we were kind of lucky in that sense because we just finished a, like a really long touring cycle for the last album and we knew that we were going into a writing process right when the virus hit. We already had some outlines for the project, but the main core was finished like during it. Um, so we had something to focus on the whole time. And when we are in writing mode, like shows kind of just distract us too much. Mm. So in that sense, we were almost lucky that some of the shows we had booked for the sort of the soul anniversary thing, for example, were postponed so we can right. focus full. And I think the album benefited from that. It, it's, uh, maybe we went deeper and further than we would have <laughs> without the virus. All right. And um, uh, musically, because we touched upon that as well, for, if, for instance, if we take a song like Garden of Cyrus, th uh, that is a very different song, I would say. So 
what is that kind of a result then of, of having that time and to explore all these kind of uh, avenues? Yeah, I guess the, the idea for Garden of Cyrus was already there before okay. the virus. The, the idea of it, but like the end product probably benefited from it. Yeah, we could, you know, craft it for a longer time, let, let it rest and could go back to it a little bit more. Um, but the main, I mean, the, the, we were very, how can you say, we were very confident in that song was going to work out. Um, and the main idea was just to like, to, as I say, keep it on Planet at the Gates, you know? Right. <laughs> you still feel like you're listening to At the Gates, even though you're, this is a different sound, but it still sounds like At the Gates. That was the main thing that we maybe, it was good that we had time to leave it for a while and then go back to it and focus on the details mm. to to make that happen even more, you know. This this might be a very tricky question to to answer because, like you say, it's 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 been a search of of yours and the band. But but what? How would you uh, describe this identity? The identity of uh, the at the gates. At the sound. gates, yes. Um, well, the, at least the constant yeah. parts, like you say, there are variables and and things can can. Uh, Go yeah, I think ways. I would go back to the, the to the more kind of like philosophical way or <laughs> in a way um, go back to the idea of like the melancholy and desperation. That's the two main parts, I guess. I know that they are just emotions and not actually, you know, uh, how can you say it? There's no not mus musical ter musical terms. Sure. But I think that's what makes us a little bit different from other death metal bands, even on the melodical death metal spectrum because those are the two key things to our sound whereas other death metal can be like aggressive or triumphant or whatever but we usually cater to those two emotions are like the main things within the band uh, of course and other people would mention like certain more musical terms but that's i think that's the key aspect for me actually final question then um with where the band is now in, in kind of uh, having been in the music industry for so long and having uh, played in all different kinds of bands, do you still worry about kind of the public's perception of what you do? Not worry. No, I wouldn't say worry. But of course, we're always curious, you know, because it's kind of like, a, how can you say, like the, the, a receipt or like a confirmation mm. that, you know, we succeeded in what we tried to do when we hear their aspects. Of course, a person can say like, yeah, I don't like this song because it has a saxophone in it. Okay, yeah, that's fine. You know, you don't like it because of that, but then, you know, you, you that, that person can't hear if he, we succeeded in trying, in what we tried to do. Mm -hmm. But another person can say that, you know, like, yeah, I really understand what you're doing here and you succeeded in that, but I still don't like it. That's okay as well. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of like a, confirmation that you know we, we are uh, doing the right thing but even if we do it for ourselves you know but we're not worried uh, to go too far so to say right we'll, i think uh, some of your colleagues uh, journalists have said that this is like a little bit of a rebirth for the band this album and it feels like if this is the start of a, of a trilogy or something you know then uh, there's going to be more adventure to come <laughs> Well, with that in mind, uh, and th that is the great thing about kind of the future, it's unexpected and, and nobody knows what uh, will come out of it. So uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, um, it's going to be really interesting for exactly, us as well. Exactly. It's going to be, uh, yeah, for, for everybody, it's going to be this adventure. So, um, yeah, Thomas, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Yeah, no problem. It was day. a good talk. Yeah. Thank you.